Hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Power. I'm Ben Wilcox. My goal is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy and power. And I want to thank you for joining me today and allowing me to be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. And this time we're going to be studying the books of First and Second Peter. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now for some background to this book. The author is, of course, Peter. <laughs> the Peter. The Galilean fisherman chosen by Christ to lead the early church after his death and resurrection. The Peter who walked on water. The eyewitness to the transfiguration. The man who was given the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the one whose vision opened the door for the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. In a modern-day context, we would consider Peter to be the president of the church, or the prophet. And so the epistle of 1 Peter would have been written near the end of Peter's life and ministry, and was most likely written between 62 and 64 AD, with 2 Peter being written shortly thereafter. In 1 Peter 5, 13, Peter tells us that he's writing this letter from Babylon, which is almost certainly a symbolic reference to Rome. The setting of 1 and 2 Peter is right around the time when Christians really began to be persecuted in the Roman Empire. Christianity had been pretty much tolerated up to that point, but the emperor Nero really changes all of that. After a devastating fire breaks out in Rome, destroying much of the city in 64 AD, Nero needed somebody to blame. And who did he choose for that dubious distinction? The Christians. And that's going to open up Christians to persecution throughout the empire. And this is when you have uh, Christians being fed to lions in the Colosseum, and many being arrested and executed. And that persecution is eventually going to lead to the deaths of both Peter and Paul around this time. And Peter even alludes to his impending death in 2 Peter 1, 14-15. And we know, according to John chapter 21, that Peter was crucified. And Christian tradition tells us that he was crucified upside down. So these are dark days for the early Christian church. That's the setting to these letters. And where the epistles of Paul are corrective, and the epistle of James is commanding, the epistles of Peter are comforting and encouraging. So again, we're going to see a shift in style and personality. Joseph Smith once said that Peter penned the most sublime language of any of the apostles. So for an icebreaker to this lesson, just for fun, I want to momentarily send you over to a different YouTube channel and then invite you to come back. Go over to the Studio C channel and watch their video entitled Mormon Misunderstanding. And here's a link to it here above, and it's also in the video description below. And you're welcome to go check that out first and then, and then come back and rejoin me. I think you'll enjoy it. But after watching... I'd ask you if you ever felt like that. Have you ever felt like your beliefs were misunderstood? Have you ever been treated differently because you were a member of the church? Have you or your beliefs ever been called strange or unusual? Or at worst, have you ever been persecuted for your beliefs? And just encourage your students to share their experiences with any of those questions. And I imagine that most of us have experienced some kind of challenging situation because of our belief and commitment to the church. And unfortunately, being misunderstood can too often lead to being mistreated as well. And that's what's happening in Peter's day. The members of the church are being sorely mocked, criticized, and persecuted. And you can see evidence of this in 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 7, and part of Peter's advice on how to view these challenges. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness throughout manyfold temptations. And temptations here should be translated as trials or afflictions. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So Peter encourages them to see their trials as precious things, more precious than gold. Suffering and persecution act as a strange kind of gift or privilege from God that that brings us praise, honor, and glory at the coming of Jesus Christ. So these letters are addressed to a people in the midst of persecution. Can we relate? Can you think of any examples of persecution against the church as a whole today? And here I'm reminded of a line from hymn number 256, as Zion's youth in latter days. The truths and values we embrace are mocked on every hand. And I believe that's true. The church is mocked and criticized for its values. The brethren and the church face constant criticism and opposition in the media for our stance on any number of issues. Gay marriage, transgender issues, abortion, women's issues, uh, amongst many other things. We're mocked in popular culture. We're one of the few religions where it's generally acceptable to make fun of, which I find interesting. I think it's a little hypocritical that it's taboo in the general media to mock Judaism or Islam or indigenous faiths, but it's totally okay to go after the Church of Jesus Christ. I mean, one of the most successful Broadway musicals in recent years is a play mocking the Book of Mormon and missionary work. We, we see protests at, at general conference. And then, and then the internet and social media are chock full of anti-church railings and articles. Now true, what we face is nothing compared to what the members in Peter's day are facing. Or in early church history. Or what some members in certain countries still face. We do have it pretty good nowadays, and and we're protected by certain laws as far as physical persecution is concerned. But we still face great opposition and criticism, and it's mounting. And the closer we get to the second coming, I think we're going to find that the stronger the pressure becomes. And it's easy to get discouraged in the face of that increasing PSI. The books of 1 and 2 Peter can help us to get through it. The suggestions that Peter is going to give to help and encourage and instruct them are also applicable to us. What can we do when we're faced with opposition to our faith? What will help us to not get discouraged? I'd like to point out four of Peter's counsels. There are others, but I'd like to cover just four. So, counsel number one. One of the reasons we're treated in the way we are is because, let's face it, we're different. Very different. And it's human nature to be suspicious and skeptical of things that are atypical. But is that difference a bad thing? No, no. No, We're not meant to be like the rest of the world. By design, we're to stand out. Peter makes that clear by giving the early Christian members some interesting titles, descriptions, and see if you can find them in each of the following verses. 1 Peter 1, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 5, and chapter 2, verse 9. And if you choose, you could have your students do this as a quick handout uh, to help them identify those descriptions, those titles. I can see at least eight. And I'm going to go ahead and give you the first letter of each word to help you out. So, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, we have elect. In chapter 2, verse 5, we've got lively stones, a spiritual house, and a holy priesthood. And then in chapter 2, verse 9, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. Now, there's a question at the bottom of the handout that I want you to consider. Take a look at that list and choose the one that you find most interesting. And think about what it teaches you 
about being a member of Christ's church. And one that I'd particularly like to draw your attention to is the last one, a peculiar people. And you might be asking yourself, uh, is, is that a compliment, Peter? And in fact, it is. It's a huge compliment. Now, now, yes, many people may think that we're peculiar or a little different and unique. But take a look at footnote 9f for an explanation of what the original Greek word suggested. And it says that peculiar means purchased, preserved. Note that in Exodus 19.5, the Hebrew word is segula, meaning special possession or property. So Peter isn't saying they're strange, but special and precious. Well, we also, as Latter-day Disciples, are segula. And how does that make us feel? Hopefully pretty good. President Nelson once said, Thus we see that the scriptural term, peculiar, signifies valued treasure, made or selected by God. For us to be identified by servants of the Lord as his peculiar people is a compliment of the highest order. So we are peculiar and proud of it. So counsel number one, when things get rough, remember that you are segula. Peter wanted to remind these suffering saints that they were a special, precious, holy, royal, and chosen people. And that was a particularly comforting message to the Gentile converts of the church. Peter is using all kinds of Old Testament terms and words and metaphors to describe them. In, in an essence, connecting the Gentiles to what was beforehand strictly exclusive to the Jews. He was saying that they too were a part of the family of God, a part of God's chosen people, precious and holy before him. And that kind of helps to know that. But we got to be careful here. Uh, the message is never, you're better than everybody else. That would be a mistake. That, that's a prideful mistake that many of the Jews made in Jesus' day. They felt that because they had the better gospel, as Paul taught us in the book of Hebrews, that they now too were better than everybody else. Well, let's not fall into that same trap. They were chosen to do something in this life. It's not a chosen of pride. Hey, I'm chosen. But a chosen of responsibility. And when you know that you have a special responsibility, it helps to give you a greater sense of purpose and belonging. I know that that thought helped me particularly in my youth. My patriarchal blessing inspired me. The prophets and my church leaders inspired me. The scriptures inspired me. I wanted to live up to that glorious expectation, that eternal weight of glory. And I hope that that thought will inspire all of us as well. We're a chosen generation. We've been reserved for the last days for a special purpose. We're of the noble birthright, and we are the hope of Israel. Don't forget that. I think that that can help us from getting too discouraged. Council number two, take a look at the following verses and you tell me if you see a common message. What do they teach us about getting through opposition and persecution? 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. 1 Peter 1, 8-9 Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. 1 Peter 1.13 Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 1.21 
who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Did you see a common theme in there? And here's what I see. Look to the future with hope. Remember that this life is not all there is. Things may be hard now, but they will get better. It's nice to know that there is an end to the test. Like like you felt that day at the end of each school year when you finished your last test or final, and now it was summer or the holidays. Such a burden lifted off the shoulders. Do you remember how free and excited you felt? Well, just imagine that feeling times a thousand. That's what it's going to feel like when we finish the test of life and pass. And now, now think of the worst trial that anybody's ever faced. It'd have to be Jesus, right? Because his suffering encompasses all of ours as well. And what did he eventually get to say near the end of his mortal life? Three beautiful words. Get is finished. I promise that if there are any of you out there that are suffering in any way, one day you'll get to utter those same three words. It is finished. If Jesus got to say them, then you certainly will too. Trials are not forever. Suffering is not forever. Pain is temporary. But salvation, happiness, love, family, grace, those things are eternal. Counsel number three. This is my favorite one and and the one that I'm going to spend the most time on this week because because it's a message that I feel is, is pretty unique to Peter. This, to me, represents maybe our best weapon against criticism, opposition, and persecution. Our offense against what Joseph Smith referred to as the whole concatenation of diabolical rascality. Doctrine and Covenants 123.5. What's the best way to silence our critics? Is it discussion? A, A media blitz? Is putting them down and pointing out their faults and problems the way to do it? Public debate? None of that. Our best tactic comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, 2, 15, and 3, 16. Can you find in those verses our greatest response to opposition? 1 Peter 2, 12. Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. 1 Peter 2.15 For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And then 3.16 Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Conversation means character. Now, did you catch it? What will best silence the ignorance of foolish people? The answer is good works, well-doing, a good conscience, and good conversation. That's how we fight back. It's like Peter saying, Yes, I understand what they're saying about us. I know they're telling lies. Here's how you counteract it. Live in such a way that others can't help but say things like, you know, I may not agree with the members of the Church of Jesus Christ. I may not like their doctrine. But dang it, they are such good people. My member neighbor is my nicest, most loyal, most helpful neighbor. My member employee is my most reliable, honest, and hardworking employee. The members of the Church of Jesus Christ that I know 
are the most generous, service-oriented, and happy people that I know of. Now, if we can live that way, when our harshest critics try to demean us or, or discredit us or slander our character, it's not going to work. People are going to say, hey, you know what you're describing doesn't match my experience with these people. I can't accept your accusations. The criticisms are not consistent with the reality of my experience. Perhaps they'll look at us and say, uh, people tell me that you guys are evil and fanatic, but your happiness and your example prove otherwise. And perhaps we'll win over some of their hearts through our good works. And maybe you've seen that happen before. Have you ever seen somebody join the church because of the good example of a righteous member? I know I have. I've spoken to many converts in the past and asked them what it was that first attracted them to the church. Many of them say that it was the good example of faithful members. They saw how happy a member family was and how they treated each other. They had a member friend that lived in such a way that they couldn't help but be, be drawn to them. Like Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, with that thought in mind, Peter's going to now give us instruction on exactly how to silence our critics through good works. These are the things that he suggests will set us up as a light to the world. Here's how we fight back. And two ideas for teaching this section. One, you could simply list the verses that I identify here up on the board, and then invite your students to look them up and identify the good works, and discuss them as you go. Or you could also play a classic concentration game with them. Here's how this works. There are 20 different tiles that are displayed on the screen. You divide your class into two teams and challenge them to find the matches. Behind half of the tiles, they're going to find scripture references from 1 Peter, and behind the other half are descriptions of the good works that Peter wants us to exemplify to the world. They're going to use their scriptures to try and determine what verse matches which message. So you have someone on one team select two different tiles. And if they match, they earn two points. If it's not a match, uh, then the cards are flipped back over and it's the other team's turn. And you just go back and forth, giving each team a chance to find the correct matches. And you'll find that the teams probably struggle for a little while at first to make matches because uh, it, it takes a bit of trial and error to become familiar with the content that's behind each tile. But as the game progresses, it gets easier and easier as they begin to remember what is where, and, and there are fewer options that remain on the board as the matches are made. They're not allowed to take notes, though, as, as they play the game. The team that has the most points at the end wins. So, a, a quick note here. If you've signed up for the New Testament handout or full subscription, a copy of this game is going to be available to you this week. So just remember that you're going to need to have the actual PowerPoint program in order to make it work, though. So here are the answers, and as we go, I'll share some of my thoughts as well. So behind tile number one, we find 1 Peter 2.11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The match is under nine. Abstain from fleshly lusts. So be pure. Be true to your spouses. Shun pornography. And be careful of the types of entertainment that you engage in. Others will notice that we don't fit into the over-sexualized nature of our society. Under 15, 1 Peter 2.12 Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles. The match is under tile 11. Be honest. Tell the truth. Be the kind of person that others can trust. Be the kinds of students that don't cheat on tests or homework. Be the kind of employee that doesn't take advantage of the company. Be the kind of friend 
or neighbor that never lies or deceives. Our honesty can set us apart from a world where dishonesty is often the norm. Go to tile 18, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. The match is under Tile 16. Be law-abiding citizens. Submit yourselves to the ordinances of man, for the Lord's sake. So let's be courteous drivers, honest business people, upholders of our civic duty, assets to our communities. Members of the church should strive to be among the best of citizens in their neighborhoods, in their states or provinces, and nations. Now go to tile number three, 1 Peter 2, 16. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. And the match is under tile 13. Don't use your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Now, what, what does that mean? I, I think we see this attitude all over our nation today. We say things like, it's a free country, so I can do whatever I want. Many evils, much maliciousness is excused in the name of liberty. Just because something isn't against the law, doesn't mean that it's right or desirable. Yes, alcohol and tobacco may not be against the law. But what have these industries done with their freedom? They've done malicious things for the sake of gain. Making their products more addictive. Peddling them to children and young people. Yes, pornography may be legal. But its effects are malicious preying on the sexual desires, especially of the young, to ensnare them into a habit that they may carry for a lifetime, wreaking havoc on marriages, their employment, and their sexual health. And again, why? For money. And think of the garbage that Hollywood produces and passes as entertainment these days. What's their rallying cry? Freedom. We have rights. We have the right to be vulgar. We have the right to be pornographic. We have the right to glorify violence and objectify women. We have the right to encourage materialism and hedonism. Well, hopefully we seek to shun that attitude. That attitude of being so focused on our rights that we forget the other side of the equation. What about responsibility? We have a responsibility to create a wholesome and happy environment for the next generation. We have a responsibility to educate. We have a responsibility to set a good example. And as members, we need to be careful not to use that tactic with others around us. We may feel justified in getting angry, telling a lie, cheating, indulging in lusts, or being prideful. But we mustn't give in to that. Let's not use our freedom as a justification for wrongdoing. Tile 14. 1 Peter 2.17, 3.8, and 4.8-9. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful, be courteous. And then uh, chapter 4, verses 8-9. through nine. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. All of these verses suggest the same thing, and it's under tile two. Love one another. As Jesus taught, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. One of the defining traits of our faith is the way that we treat each other, hopefully with great love. Joseph Smith said something really, really fascinating. He said, 
we ought always to be aware of those prejudices which sometimes so strangely present themselves and are so congenial to human nature against our friends, neighbors, and brethren of the world, who choose to differ from us in opinion and in matters of faith. Our religion is between us and our God. Their religion is between them and their God. There is a love from God that should be exercised toward those of our faith, who walk uprightly, which is peculiar to itself. But it is without prejudice. It also gives scope to the mind, which enables us to conduct ourselves with greater liberality towards all that are not of our faith than what they exercise towards one another. Do you get what he's saying there? In other words, our faith allows us to love other members of our faith in such a way that it affects the way we see and treat all people, regardless of their faith. That love that the true gospel of Jesus Christ engenders allows us to love the Baptists better than the Baptists love themselves, to serve Muslims better than the Muslims serve each other, to feel a kinship with Jehovah's Witnesses stronger than the kinship that they feel with each other, to be kind to the atheists better than the atheists are kind to each other. If we can develop and demonstrate that kind of love, it can be a great force into bringing many to the faith. Tile number four, 1 Peter 2.18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. And froward means crooked or wicked. The the match under tile 19. Be subject to your masters. Be good employees. Be subject to them and loyal. And not just for the good and gentle bosses, but be a good employee, even if your boss is kind of a jerk. Right? Tile 8. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, and chapter 3, verse 9. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And then chapter 3, verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. So what he's saying is, is don't reward persecution with persecution. That's going to be under tile six. Follow the example of Christ in dealing with opposition and reviling. How did he deal with it? He reviled not again. The people that oppose us Let's not resort to their tactics. Let's not sink to their level. They may publish pamphlets and YouTube videos entitled 50 Things That Are Wrong With Mormonism. And they may show up at our meetings and general conference with signs decrying our doctrines. They may spew accusations and criticisms of our doctrines all over Instagram and Twitter and Reddit. Let's not do the same. That's not how we fight back. We fight back with our good works. You're never going to hear a general conference talk entitled Lutherans, Satan's Henchmen, or read an article in the Liahona called Ten Ridiculous Catholic Beliefs, or will the church ever produce a hilarious musical play called The Koran, Mocking Islam. We don't respond in kind to persecution. Tile 17, 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 7. And the match here is is under tile 5. And I'm not going to go verse for verse through this one, but I'm just going to summarize it with the statement. Have exemplary marriages. We've got to show the world what marriage can be. To be respectful of each other, chaste, to trust in God. Husbands, preside with your priesthood in righteousness, and wives honor and compliment that priesthood. And I feel that we do pretty well on this one uh, as a church, collectively. On the whole, I think we do have some of the strongest marriages. 
And I know this phrase in verse 7 may give some people fits, but I don't think it should. It says, give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, when he says weaker vessel, he isn't saying that women are weak or fragile or powerless. He's not saying that they're weaker intellectually or morally or even physically necessarily. He's saying that their vessels take a different shape. He's making a comparison to different kinds of pots or dishes. Back then, as now, you've got different kinds of of pots that you use for different reasons. Some you use to cook food, and others you have to serve and display the food. I have a beautiful Greek vase that I bought in Athens, hand-painted, carefully formed. I also have a giant cast-iron Dutch oven. Now, both are important to me, and they have value and perform different functions. But I give honor to the Greek face in a special way. It may be weaker in the sense that it isn't as thick and sturdy as my Dutch oven, but it isn't less than or less important than. I think that's what Peter's saying here. Husbands, treat your wives as a precious, beautiful, and unique gift. And you know what? It, this may not be politically correct to say, because nowadays it's just, it's heresy to even suggest that men and women are different. But I believe that they are. In my experience, women as a gender are generally more sensitive to the needs of others, more loving, more beautiful, more nourishing, more charitable, and feel empathy and sympathy more deeply as a part of their divine nature. That's my experience in the women in my life. And I believe that's the way their Heavenly Father has made them. So there, I said it, right? Men and women are not the same. God has endowed each with equally valuable but different strengths and gifts, generally speaking, collectively speaking. And the gifts of women remind me more of the Greek vase and men, the Dutch oven. Moving on, under tile 12, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The match, tile 7. Be always ready to testify of your hope in Christ. Now, if we live the way that Peter is encouraging us to live, people are going to be curious about us. They're going to see our good works. And since righteousness was always happiness, they're going to see that hope and joy in us and ask us where it comes from. Be ready with a good answer to that question. That's the perfect missionary opportunity that you don't want to squander. They see something in you that's desirable. Don't give them some offhand answer. Don't deflect the question. Tell them where your hope comes from. It comes from the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It comes from obedience to prophetically inspired commandments. It comes from the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let's say that to them. Tie your hope and happiness to your faith. Recently, there was a study done on what states in the United States are considered to be the happiest. Guess which state came out on top? Utah, a state that is predominantly filled with members of the church. That's just one more evidence that the restored gospel equals happiness. And I'll include a link to that article in the video description below if you're interested. All right, uh, one more. Uh, under tile number 10, 1 Peter 4, verses 3 through 4. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. We don't celebrate and mingle and have fun like the rest of the world does. Our gatherings have a different spirit to them. As a teacher one time, I remember using the word partying in a list of things that we shouldn't do. 
and a confused student raised their hand and asked, is it bad to have parties? And, and I know in their mind, they were thinking of cake and ice cream and party hats and presents. And I assured that student that it was okay. And I encouraged her to maintain her innocent understanding of that word. That's a good sign that that's what the word party meant to her. A church party is going to be a little bit different from a regular party. We don't take things to excess uh, like the rest of the world. Revelings, banquetings, riot, right? So, so let's not celebrate like the world does. And before we conclude this portion or this council, just for fun, I'm going to throw in a quick thought from chapter 5, 1 Peter 5. Uh, it's for church leaders. Uh, and again, we do things differently, leadership and authority differently in the church. And I'll let you go deeper into that chapter on your own, but here are some things that you'll see. This is what a Christ-like leader does. They feed their flock. They don't constrain or order people around. They're good examples of what they teach. They're humble, sober, or, or in control, vigilant, steadfast. And they seek to protect their flocks from the devil, that roaring lion that walks around seeking whom he may devour. And that's an interesting metaphor for Peter to use in this this context, Satan as a lion. And, and you might remember, like I said earlier, this was a time when perhaps Christians are being fed to lions, to real lions by the Romans. So Peter reminds them of the lion that they really need to worry about most, uh, Satan, not the actual lions of the Colosseum. And so, so there we have it, a whole list of things that we can do to fight back against persecution and opposition. Our number one offensive move against the lion and the world are our good works. Living in this way may be some of the greatest missionary work that we ever do. I feel that probably the most powerful testimony that Joseph Smith ever gave for the truthfulness of the restored gospel is the members of the church themselves. Who we are and how we act. And how blessed we are because of it. It speaks volumes for the divinity of his work right? and his calling as a prophet. Perhaps the greatest evidence of its veracity is how it makes people better and happier. Right, the last council I'm going to do as an activity and it comes from the book of Second Peter. This fourth council is very similar to what we studied back in First and Second Timothy, and it's a message that's going to come up again in Jude next week. But a major problem in the early church was false teachers and false prophets popping up all over the church. Now, I believe this council is still applicable to our day, but maybe in a bit of a different fashion. I'm not as worried about people within the church leading others astray and teaching false doctrine, although that does happen and we got to be careful of it. But I don't think that false prophets only come in the context of religious figures or zealots or apostates. I think the false prophets and teachers are all around us, the prophets of the world. And sadly, we do give them a lot of our attention. They can come in the form of celebrities, social media personalities, journalists, intellectuals, politicians, college professors. We got to be careful who we give our attention to and pick the right prophets. So that's the name of this activity, picking the proper prophets. And here's how this works. I've written down a large number of qualities that true prophets have and false prophets have that, that Peter's going to teach us. And we may remember Christ's advice on how to tell the difference between true and false prophets. He said, by their fruits, you shall know them. Peter's going to elaborate on that idea. He's going to go into more detail on those fruits. And what we'll do is we're going to read Peter's words, and then your job will be to pick out the matching description of what a false prophet does or what a true prophet does in plain language. And this activity will hopefully help you to see why it's so important to keep our focus on the true prophets 
and limit our contact with the prophets of the world. And you can do this as a handout, or you could do it together as a class with the slides, if you like. So pick the proper phrase that represents what the scripture is saying. And we're going to start with the qualities of a true prophet first. And for this one, I'm not going to read the full text of each verse. I'm going to let you do that. But I am going to give you the answers. So, qualities of a true prophet. From chapter 1, verse 4, the answer is E. They remind you of God's promises and help you fulfill your divine nature. True prophets inspire you and lead you to become your best self a person with the divine potential to become like God. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. F. They teach you Christ-like qualities and encourage you to develop them. True prophets teach you things that will lead you to become more like Christ. 1, 12 through 15. They consistently remind you of God's truth. That's B. The answer is B. True prophets may sound repetitive, but they don't want you to forget key truths and counsels for your benefit. 119. The answer is C. Their counsels are tried and tested and bring light into your life. The words of true prophets are sure. The sure word of prophecy. They've been shown time and time again to bring happiness. Chapter 1, verse 20. The answer is D. They don't teach their own opinions and interpretations. True prophets don't twist the truth. They teach it straight, pure, and undiluted from the scriptures. And then chapter 121, the answer is A. They speak by the power of the Holy Ghost. It's easy for you to feel the Spirit when they speak. True prophets have the Spirit. You feel good things when you listen to them. Those are the qualities of a true prophet. How can you tell a false prophet? Next activity. Chapter 2, verse 1. F. They slowly try to introduce damaging ideas into your life. False prophets are very subtle. They do things privily. They're patient. They slowly draw you away from the path. Chapter 2, verse 2. C. They talk badly about the straight and narrow path. They tell you that rules are lame. False prophets are always trying to make the right way seem boring, old-fashioned, or behind the times. Chapter 2, verse 3. G. They tell you what you want to hear to get money from you. They want to make merchandise out of you. False prophets appeal to our lowest desires and their, their major motivation is money. Alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling, fashion, entertainment. These industries do not have your best interest at heart. They want what's in your wallet. Chapter 2, verse 7. D. They have filthy mouths and they speak of disturbing things. False prophets always seek to shock and push the boundaries of decency. Chapter 2, verse 10. E. They despise any type of authority. Parents, teachers, church leaders, governments, law enforcement. False prophets don't want any rules. They encourage disrespect and a defiance of law. 2.19. H. They promise you freedom and ease while leading you into addiction and loss. False prophets rage against commandments and standards. While promising freedom, they deceitfully lead us into captivity. Chapter 2, verse 20 and 22. A. Their desire to repent is fleeting, and they quickly return to their old ways. False prophets may possibly show a desire to change, but like a dog to its vomit, which is a pretty gross image if you think about it, they always return to the corrupt. Chapter 3, verse 16, B. They tell lies based on a kernel of truth, maybe even from the scriptures. False prophets may sound good and even seem to make sense, but they always twist the truth to their purposes. Hopefully that gives us all a better understanding of what separates 
true prophets from false ones, the qualities that will help us to identify them. Keep your eyes peeled for these fruits, and the likelihood of us being deceived is going to be greatly diminished. And there we have it. Overall, four extremely effective ways to deal with opposition, mocking, and the persecution of the latter days. Remember that we're Segula. Find hope in the promise that there will be an end to all suffering through Christ. Silence the critics by your good works and pick the proper prophets. I firmly believe that if we do these four things, there's no criticism that we cannot deflect, no opposition that we cannot confront, and no persecution that we cannot endure. So thank you, Peter, for your help. And that's going to conclude our lesson for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for joining me, and I invite you to join me again next week. Uh, Teachers, if you want access to the resources, go to teachingwithpower.com. You'll find links to those resources there. If you haven't subscribed or hit the like button or or made a comment, uh, those things will help the channel to be pushed out uh, to more and more people. So I'd appreciate uh, if you do that. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.